Carl Lewis is one of two athletes to win nine Olympic gold medals. Similarly, he is one of two to win four gold medals in the same event. He also won 10 medals, including eight gold, at the World Outdoor Championships, the most by any athlete in the world. Carl currently serves as an assistant coach in the jumps and sprints at his alma mater, the University of Houston. Please welcome my fellow alum, Carl Lewis. All right, hello everyone. Good afternoon, I hope everyone's having a good day so far. Um, Carl Lewis right here. <laughs> Um, but yes, today we are in for a treat, this presentation, um, So You Want to Run Fast. It's basically for you as coaches to learn what we can do to really push um, the athletes in the right direction and sort of help them. Um, my name is Barmel Lyons. I'll be your moderator for tonight. I currently attend the University of Central Florida. I'm 22 years old, so I'm really looking forward to really helping push this whole presentation forward. Um, today, we're going to do something a little different. We're gonna have more of a town hall format. Basically, with that being said, we're gonna have more, it's gonna be interactive. You can ask questions. We have three mics, one in the middle and on the two sides right here. So. During our question times, if you ever feel like you need to ask something to clarify the material, you can definitely come up to these mics and ask your questions. Alrighty, and we also have questions on Twitter um, that we're going to be incorporating during our pauses as well, so we get to not only your questions, but everyone's questions. So I look forward to this, and let's get started. Okay, well, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I just want to say I'm excited to be here, because my, my objective is really taking you back a little bit, but taking you forward. Because when I, you know, we talked about all the medals that I was able to achieve, I achieved those because of hard work, discipline. But if I didn't know someone named Tom Telez, you wouldn't know me. And I wouldn't believe that. And he's, Tom Telez is really the, uh, the basis for the philosophy of all the coaching that I do. And just to go through our points, you know, it was interesting because when I came to him in the beginning, um, I went to the University of Houston for one reason. It was not a very good program at the time. People didn't know. But when I was 17 years old, I decided that I wanted to jump 29 feet. And I went on seven visits. And six schools told me all these things. I decided what school I was going to go. And then I went to the University of Houston. The visit was terrible. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't wait to get out of there. And then the last hour, I talked to Coach Salaz. He says, I think you can break the wrong record. Well, I said, it didn't matter what happened. So the whole way home, there was a man on my shoulder saying, that's where you're going. So that's what happened. So the basis of what I wanted to do started with setting the ultimate goal. And I think for all of you, a lot of times we get caught up in uh, performance and how fast you run and medals and honors won. But what you really do is have the most ultimate goal from day one. I mean, what is the time that you want to say you ran when you're 40 years old? And, or the distance, we'll talk about that tomorrow. But really it's about what time do you want to say you accomplished? And that's the goal you should start, because when you set a personal best, it's just along the way. So that's what he taught me. And then, you know, he was always coaching. And, that, and just to give you a funny example, in the 84 Olympics, I had to go for four events. And the first one was 100 meters. I get out there. I'm in the blocks. I'm nervous. There's 93,000 people. I run the race. We cross the line, do my victory lap. Then I get down, and I go into the mix zone. And the first person I see is Coach Telez. I run up to him and run to hug, run to hug him. And he stopped me and said, you know what, if you had pushed out of the block, you'd have broke the world record. And I'm like, dude, I just won the gold medal. Yeah, but the next time you better push so you can break the world record. So they said, come on and give you a hug. But, but it, it, was a, it was a clear message that it's always about business. And then once you perform well, then you can do well. And then the last thing is that, you know, people say to me a lot of times, you're old school. Well, I'm 55 years old. I say double nickels. And a lot of the guys, I hear you're old man every single day from the athletes. But old school is real school. You know, the bottom line is that I think the first people that ran fast in the history of the world were cavemen. Do you think cavemen ran poorly? They ran fast because, you know, there was a mastodon running around there or a big old saber-toothed tiger trying to catch them. They were trying to look pretty. So the bottom line is that what we're learning now in the new time is just things that we add on. It doesn't change the basics. So the thing about Coach Telez and the, the way that I work with the athletes, it's really pretty simple. Uh, we, can, we can go into a, a lot of talk and we can talk about a lot of different things, but I try to break it down very simple in ways that people can understand it and people can uh, take it easy. So let's go into this one. Now, 
we talk about skills and development. Now, you, you, you just say getting 100%. Now, what does that really mean? And what are those arches? Well, the thing about it is what I tell the young people when they train is that it's, you cannot do certain things until you've accomplished other things. So we always say you want to accomplish 100% because our goal is perfection. We're not competing against the other person. We're not competing against anyone around. We're competing against the perfect you. So everything's about being the absolute best you can be. And the athlete, because of that, we need to learn the basic components of arm stroke and all those things first, and then you move, move later. Now the reason we have our arches is because you're gonna learn something and then all of a sudden you say, oh, that's great. Now your chin needs to stay down all the time. And then, that, then all of a sudden you go backwards, you feel like it's hard again. And then you learn that and then it's something new. So it's always gonna be a new challenge. Because you know, as long as you're learning something, you're thinking, and as you're thinking, you're not performing because you're hesitating. You know, what's really interesting is, we'll talk about this in a second, of, of how difficult sprinting and running really is if you look at it in the context of what we're doing. And then always focus on the performance, like, like I said, never the place. Because, you know, you can't control what place you get in a competition. You can't control it. Oh, I, won, I won a gold medal. I didn't control one single gold medal that I won in any of those competitions. I always said, if I run this or jump that, I will win the race. That's what I can control. So let's move on. Now, the, what are the variables? There are really three things to it. It's the arm stroke. Now, starting with the arm stroke, which is very important because, you know, spraying, we, we coach spraying that goes from the arms down because the legs, as we heard so many times, the legs will follow the arms. So what, what I just, I try to come up with little things to make it easier for the athletes to remember what they're supposed to do. And so I came up with this little, this little line. I say, elbows to the sky, thumbs to the eye. Now, we're going to see it later in the video a little bit, but elbows to the sky is the arm back and up to the sky, thumbs to the eye. And, and when you want to stroke, the thing is, you want to keep yourself tall. So as you, as you stroke forward, and I'll show you, you stroke, there is a, there's this opening. So the arm opens, goes to the elbow, and it's, it opens a little bit, and it goes to your pocket, and it comes back and thumbs to the eye. Now why that's important is because when that arm stops here is when you stop pushing on the ground. See, so if your arm stops short, you stop pushing. And if you stop pushing, you have to lift. So it's extremely important to make sure that, that that thumb comes to the eye so that you're continuing to push. The opposite leg is pushing on the ground. Now body position. Well, we want to be tall because the, the thing about it is that if you're bending, then you're creating a different reaction. So well, we, we, we try to get athletes to always think, the first thing is to say, look, I want you to run taller than you stand. If you're running shorter than you stand, then that means you're sitting. So keep your hips forward and, and stay tall. Ooh, okay, I, I could probably do that three out of five times. All right, now, why, why is it important to stay tall and keep the hips forward? Because you can get the body position a little bit forward because you know what? The last thing is foot placement. Now, the thing is your foot placement should be down. And so many people ask me, how can I put my feet straight down basically and move forward? Well, I'll show you with this tennis ball. So, if I, want this t if I drop this tennis ball, it just, it just goes. Now, everyone knows, and these are simple things that I use uh, because I, I'm, I'm not going to get into all the big words because I talk to kids from high school to college, elementary. I want something they can understand. And I ask them all, if you want that ball to go higher, what do you do? They say you slam it down harder. So it's a simple thing. So therefore, if you apply more force to the ground, then you're going to get more force off the ground and the legs can cycle. So, but, but it doesn't work if the body's not tall and you're, you're, you're body position is a little forward because now you're pushing down and back. Now one of the things about foot placement you guys are going to find, especially with shorter sprints, is that they think that as they get faster, their stride has to get farther. You know, they think, oh, I have to open my stride to get, to get faster. Well, the reality is you open your stride, you're not getting maximum push because you have to always do this because if I push like that, we're not getting the same re rebound back. So, what, what, what I tell them is it should be a constant rhythm as a stride gets farther because you have two ways to create stride length. And I'll show you. One is, watch my left foot. This way or the other way. Watch my right foot. This way. See the difference? So one is reaching to create it, the other is pushing. 
So what we want to do is we want to continue to, to push down more. That's how you go. So it really seems like your feet are going down faster. So a lot of them say, my, my stride's too fast. Well, you're creating more force, so you're moving through the air faster. And that's really what we want to do. So that's the thing. They have to keep putting their feet down and not reaching. The body has to, the feet have to touch uh, below the center of gravity in order to propel the body forward. Now, why is that correct? Because we all know that basically the, the muscles below the waist are not designed to pull. And so we want to make sure we, we do that. You're always pushing so you avoid injuries. Because in reality, if we train properly, we really shouldn't be injured very much. And that's just that's something that we should make sure that we do not do. So it's so important to make sure the mechanics are done first, especially with the young athletes, and sometimes it takes a long time because we want to make sure they avoid injury. We really shouldn't be that injured. And, and that's the first thing we do. I look at it, I evaluate all the athletes and say, you're doing this, you're doing this, let's correct that so that you will not get injured. Now, the frustrating thing about it, and then let's look at this. So, every human being is genetically predisposed to run basically a certain type of way. And so, eat whatever that way is to you. And some people are really born, they run extremely well. And so, you've got genetics, and that's thousands and thousands of years of genes that are in your body, that are telling you what to do. And then guess what? You have probably run that way millions of times. Think about how many times your feet have hit the ground. Because you know, when you're running fast, they hit the ground between three, four, five times a second. So if you think about it, by the time you're 15, 16, 17 years old, your feet have probably hit the ground millions of times doing the same thing. Now, all of a sudden, you, you, you meet a coach in high school or somewhere, and they may say, it may be the math teacher, it may be someone else. It says, do it this way. Well, now you spend time doing it that way. So you did that thousands of times. So now your body's really confused. And then guess what we're saying? We're going to do this the correct way, which is the third way. So guess what? The only way to do it is over and over and over. Because think about it. What can you do? What can you think of and then do in one second? So that's how fast it goes. So the frustration in doing it over and over sets in, and that's your job as a coach and our job to make sure that these athletes know, look, let me be frustrated, you just do it again. That's what I tell them all the time. Oh, I can't believe that. Oh, give it to me, do it again. Because it, there's no way to do it without doing it over and over until it's comfortable and you don't have to think about it. So that's really the basis of it. So you know, I, I just want to stop in between and pick up questions and we can do it. If there's anything anybody wants to ask right now, we can and we also have some questions. And then we'll move on to the next section. Any questions, anyone? If you want, you can definitely come up to one of the three mics if you have any questions about what he spoke about. All right. Well, that's good. You're all invited to my next board meeting. So now, the breaking down the race. Uh, this is something that Coach Chalaz worked out that, that uh, we've worked with a long time. Now, as you can see, 1% is the reaction time, 5% is block clearance, 64% uh, is speed of, uh, speed of efficient acceleration, maintenance of maximum velocity, and then lessening degree of deceleration. Well, as you can see, look what's most important, because that's when you're running the most, and that's where you make up the most distance. But if you don't focus on one and two, you can't set up the third one. Now, that, what happens is oftentimes we, we try to, our athletes want to try to rush to the third one. So let's go to the box. Now, here, here is Cameron Burrell, an athlete in Houston. Now, I'm sorry, I have to say this, but the person that took these pictures, I wasn't there, and it's so ridiculous that my name's in the background. So if y'all think like I'm narcissistic, I couldn't believe it either. <laughs> I couldn't kill it, I'm sorry. It's ridiculous. But anyway, so the thing about it, everyone's start um, is unique to their body. Now, what we, what, we, what we do is that we want to make sure we get to those angles. So in order to, to work that out, Cameron is uh, in the front block and the back block. We want 90 degrees in the front block, 135 degrees in the back block. That's something we've been doing for years. And, and the thing is, what's really important is you see his shoulders directly over the hand. The head is in line with the body. Now, that, that should be something that each athlete does. So you're going to have to start the athlete by putting them in the blocks, changing the blocks, moving them until you get these angles in the set position. And it is really important because the start is like your fingerprint. It has to be precise. 
So that's really important. You can't wing the start. It's something that makes a big difference. It's not a matter of who has the best start or who gets out first. It's a matter of what the start is doing. It's setting up the 64%. That's the whole job of it. Now, as you see Cameron's mentoring, I know a lot of you have your athletes uh, that measure. Well, we do that as well because we want it to be precise. We don't want the athletes to go out and guess, use their feet with different blocks, that kind of thing. So once we have the setting, then we, all, we always measure, make sure they, they measure it, they get the exact same start distance every single time. And that's because we're back to trying to run the perfect race. And that's what it is. And, and what we always do, we, we have the front block all the way down, the back block up one, so it allows you to push out of the back block in a different way. So we move. You have a question from Twitter on this one. Yes, you do have a question from Twitter, and okay. um, it's concerning the tape. So, <laughs> so we can't tape the tape to me, so what are you supposed to do? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, I found out, okay? So every single week, someone, I forgot my tape. So I started making them put their names on it. I forgot my tape. So one, one of the athletes, a young athlete we have, came up with a pretty good idea. She, she bought two rolls of ribbon. She's, she was in high school, by the way, smarter than my guys. And she bought two rolls of ribbon. And the long one, she, she cut up about 50 pieces, the long one. And she cut up the other color. She cut up about 50 pieces of the short one. And then she put, put them all in her bag. So when she goes to a meet, she'll pull out one of each. She can measure it, throw it away. So, if, and, and some people can use their tape measures all along. You know, get a tape measure. Um, if you have an old tape measure that you use in the field of or something, don't throw it away. Cut it up into pieces. I did that as well. We had one that broke, so I just cut it up into 100 pieces and able to use that. You only, generally only need three feet. So, whatever it is, but that's extremely important to have your tape measure to make sure. Because remember, the start is your, uh, just, just like your uh, fingerprint. And one more question from Twitter. Uh, how did you speed up your reaction time? Okay, um, you know what, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So, and I'm actually going to do a little something with, with the audience. And people ask me all the time, how does your reaction time get better? Well, the first thing is that if, if, we're, if you're in a room or you're somewhere, what I used to do, and, and, and I actually had a pretty good reaction time all the time, but what, what I would do is when I got into set position, I would clear my mind. And I guess the easiest way to describe that, if you were sitting in this room, and you wanted to hear something across the room, you, you, whether it's here or anywhere else, you just clear your mind and you listen for the gun. Because see, oftentimes we're trying to anticipate the gun. And um, we have the no false start rule in the world, which I totally 110% agree with, because you should wait for the gun. So learn to wait for the gun instead of trying to beat the gun. So really just, the biggest thing is just clearing your mind when you're in the blocks and waiting for the gun. Because what you, what you can do in, in the mark, the set, go position is go through those elements. Because if you want to try to achieve perfection, you need to make sure you know what you have to do. And I'll, I'll pick up more of that uh, right after this. But oh, we got it. Now, we're talking about block pairs. That's 5%. So on the, left, on the left side, you can see he is now in set position. As you can see, his shoulders are still directly over his hands. Head is still in line with the body, and he's ready to go. So what happens is you can see, look at the back block. The back block, his foot is completely on that block and the front block as well. That's extremely important because it sets up what we're going to do on the second one. You, you make sure when they go up, they put pressure on the back block because when we go to the second one, as you see their circle, now that we have the angle, he's starting to move. But you see how in the back block, the ankle joint closes up. Well, you get a reflex action in your, in your Achilles tendon, so therefore, that's it. Because here is where it gets tricky. Um, it's a little bit slower to push off both blocks because you should push equally off both blocks. It seems a little slower. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's, it's like it's too long. Well, the reality is that just, just put it in perspective of, a, of if you're going to throw a ball. If you want to throw a ball far, you wind up and you throw that ball. Now, you, I don't have to tell you that if you want to throw a ball farther and faster that you have to wind up and do it. You know it. And if you try to throw it from here, it comes out of your hand faster, but it's not going to go as fast or as far. So think of the back foot as, uh, as the back swing. So the more action you get off the back foot, the more movement you get, and the easier it makes for you to push farther off the front block. But if you pull the back foot out, 
then you don't then you're putting too much pressure on the front block. So you want to get the, get the momentum moving from the back block. That's extremely important. So it's going to seem slower, but it's more powerful because the start is really about powerful, being powerful. And then when you when you come out, as you can see, camera's back foot is going. And now on the second slide, he's at he's at the 40, 45 degree angle, and there are two things there why he's able to do that. Number one, as you see, his back arm is bent. Now, oftentimes you'll see the back arm in a starter straight. Well, what happens when that back arm is straight, it automatically bends you at the waist. It's just automatic. So it's really important to keep that back arm bent and the front arm up because that allows you to rise. Now, you push, you push off both blocks and you push because what you want to do is coming out of the blocks, knees up, feet down. Because think about this, when you, when you push, if your body's in that 45 degree angle, it has room for that knee to come off the block and come up and go down. Because your first three steps are going to be on the ball of your foot. And then by fourth step, you're really up and running. And, and, and so the reason you want that is because you want to have clearance so that your knees can get up and push. Because everything out of the blocks is about pushing and patience. You see, people want to be quick out of the blocks. Now, think about this. If you got on a 10, who's been on a 10 speed bike before, I'm sure? Well, gosh, uh, most of y'all's age may not even know a 10 speed bike. Um, but if, if, you, if you ever get on a bike and it's in 10 gear, it's hard to push. But you know you need the power to do it. That's really what the start is. It seems like it's slow, but you're pushing and covering ground. Because at the start, you want to cover ground. It's not about quickness. It's covering ground. Because if you're covering ground, it's like the backswing of the 64%. That's why it's so important to be patient. If you get quick and the steps get small, you're not covering ground. So it may seem slow, but it's more powerful. And it's setting you up later. Because everything we do on the first two is to set up the 64%. And so what we want to see is the athletes really pushing. And each step should get bigger and bigger. And it seems like it seems small, it seems uh, too big, and it may seem slower, but it's powerful. And that, that's what's really important. And that's going to be a tough thing because a lot of kids want to be really quick. They want to get out of the box and be quick, put the feet down, and they've got to learn to, uh, to really push and do it. What I do is I put uh, pieces of tape down just for them to learn. Uh, in the beginning, just for guidance, I put it like three feet, then the next one four feet out, then the next one five feet out. Just for a, a reference to know that I've got to keep pushing. So that is extremely important because once you push yourself to the fourth step, then you're, then you're up through the fourth step. You're up and running. And now it's the acceleration phase. So we have anything, anyone to talk about that? Any questions? Yeah. What are some coaching cues that you use for athletes to focus on that uh, being patient and not yeah. being quick? Uh, what, what are some cues on being patient? You know, the, the thing is, that what, like I was saying, what I'll, what I'll do with them is I'll, I'll put some tape down. And, and, and there is no set distance for an athlete because obviously their legs are different, their bodies are different, so there's no set difference. But I'll start with a certain distance just so they have a reference. And then as they learn to push, I'll, I'll stretch it out because it's really just the first three steps. Because that's, but the key is convincing them to be patient because they want, they'll go the first step, they'll really push, and then they'll get quick the second and third step. So the key is just uh, putting, putting some tape marks in their lane. So uh, to, to give a reference, that, that, that stride's got to be past that, because remember here at the angle, you can't see it. But the thing is, is that why that's so important is because the, out of the block, the knee has to come up and down, because you can't push unless the knee is up and pushing down. So should they be telling themselves, push, 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 push? Push, push, absolutely. That's, that's something they can do. And, and, and what's so important is I love cues in, in your head. I love those cues saying push, 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 you have to, anything. But they've got something that's got to keep them back because ultimately we are thinking about what doing it right is about perfection. And so therefore, by going that way, they may not always be the first person out of the blocks. Someone's just turning over is going to be the first person out because they're quick and they're going their feet are down. But we're trying to set up the 64%. So, so you have to always remember we're setting up the 64%. Definitely, definitely. Um, one question that we have from Twitter is, is there any other drills that you use in order to encourage this, aside from you know having the tape on the ground? Is there anything else that you have in regards to drills? Yeah, well, one of the things that, that I do with the guys is that we, 
we run longer in our start. When we do starts, we'll basically do six starts on a day. That's all we do on, on start day. And I'll, I'll do two people at a time so I can watch them. And generally what I'll do is, is have them come out like 30 minutes staggered so they can warm up, do their six. And so we'll do tw two at 20, two at 40, one at 50, and one at 60. So the thing is, so they have to push all the way to that acceleration phase. That's, that's really the big thing. And because I think that they have to understand the rhythm of it. Now, just, just to give you an example, a lot of times they'll even get 15 or 20 meters down and start running fast again. Now, who, who is who here, you know, here, I, like I said, I, I, I'm like the, the, the regular simple person. Who in here has ever had to push a car? Now, when you push a car, look, look at this. When you push a car, you don't start pushing the car like <laughs> you push it. Car. It takes long because you're getting momentum going, right? And then as the car goes, when do you start turning your feet over quick? You really don't. Your feet catch up with, you keep pushing because you know you have to push because this car is heavy, so your feet get faster because you're pushing, not because you start going faster. So it's the same thing. So it's the patience. So that's what we try to do. We work on that so they learn how to be patient. And sometimes I'll slow them down to half speed so they can worry about just the pushing and not worry about it. But then we always go to, because on Tuesdays we do our starts, the guys do, uh, they race when they do starts. That's just the way it's always been. That's what we do. Definitely, definitely. Any more? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, do you have a specific height for the pedal deck? Oh, good question. Um, the, the front pedal is always, always all the way down. The back pedal is up one. And the reason we do that is so that you, you're at a better angle to get the 135 angle, so that you can, you can push better for the ankle. So the back one is up one, the front one's all the way down. Now, um, here's one of the problems we have, and it's really interesting because I used to, used to, be, used to have a deal with, uh, 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 with the blocks, starting block people. And they started putting those high blocks. Well, I was complete. I said, don't do, do the high block, leave the short blocks. They're like, no, because you can push off them better. Well, actually, by putting the high blocks, you can't get, you can't get the same push because your, your foot can't close, the ankle joint can't close. So you really cannot get as much push. So, coaches, if you order blocks, order the short ones because it is easier to start with those short ones. All right? Okay. And, yeah? Where does three feet start from the line? The three feet from the line. But the key is each step has to get those first three steps. And remember now, the first three steps are going to be at all your feet and then you're up. Because um, a, lot, you know, a lot of people say, oh my goodness, I'm coming, especially the high school kids. Oh, I'm supposed to stay down, I'm supposed to stay down. Well, first of all, staying down, your knees can't, you can't push on the ground and they can't cycle. Because as we know, as we're running, we want to cycle like you're on a bicycle. So if you're down, your knees can't cycle, so therefore you're pushing back and not down and you can't stand tall. So at, by the fourth step, you should be up and running. Okay, and I see one more question right there, and then we're going to wrap up this section. Yeah. Uh, what's your ratio of uh, athlete running solo versus Okay, uh, ratio, like what percentages? Well, it, it, it depends on... Okay, 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 uh, good question. Well, it depends, okay, here's what I do. Uh, I break it up into two seasons. The fall season, which we're finished with, and I hope that everyone believes the same thing. Thank God it's over and we're ready for Christmas. I need a two-week break from those kids. Um, and in the fall, what I do is that, you know, we're, we're limited, to, limited in college by hours. So, but the field events and technical things. So what I do is in, in the fall, I take them one-on-one -on -one every Wednesday. So everyone's slots of time when we work on it Wednesday. During the season, uh, that's for starts, running mechanics, everything. So I work... Every single person gets, you know, pure 30, sec 30 minutes in the fall. So if we, if we, when I see them in high school or I see the first practice, okay, I need to work on his arms, on his legs, on his chin, then they get that time. And then we, the whole objective is when we start running the, the, the spring season, they've fixed it or they're moving somewhere or they understand the terminology enough where they can run with people. Now, the second thing I do is that I put them together from day one, uh, first meeting in, in, two, in pairs. Now what I do normally, I look at the guys and I put them in pairs. Generally it's an upper class and with a freshman, someone that I think that'll challenge each other. So the, the, the whole point is that I can watch, it's easy to watch two people at a time. 
And then sometime during the year that may change or may switch people out. Like for instance, last year um, I had Mario Burke, who's a, who's a freshman sprinter with Cameron Burrell. Well, I, I, that worked out very well. And so that's the thing. And, but then certain workouts, when we do our longer sprinting on Mondays um, and starts on Tuesdays, we usually do starts two at a time. They'll line up six blocks and we'll do two, two, two. On Wednesdays, when we get into the spring season, and we have to run anything below, um, anything below 200, 150, 90, 80, 70, 60, hundreds, or anything like that, they always run by themselves because that's the time where we focus on mechanics. So if we run, a, we, we we generally let's say on a Monday we run a breakdown of 432, then they'll run the hundred in their flats by themselves, or if they run 150s, they'll run them by themselves. Um, or we have a workout 90, 80, 70, 60 by themselves, because that's when they're running their fastest, and I want to really be able to watch them specifically and focus on their mechanics, because it comes back to we're trying to run perfect. And so that's, that's usually when they run by themselves. All right, so we're going to wrap up this Let's Talk okay. About It section and continue. <laughs> now, we're going we're gonna to watch Cameron just, just run. So, so that's, that's part of the... Uh, and a beginning of an approach. But as you see, as we'll, we'll go back through it again and slow it down. You'll watch every step as Cameron's pushing. You'll watch every step, his leg cycles, and you see he's getting taller and taller each time. You see, you can tell he's getting taller and taller. And that's really what it is, because the thing about it is that it's always pushing. Sprinting is always pushing. It's never pulling. It's always pushing. And as long as you're pushing, you're going to continue to move down the track, and as long as you stay tall and keep your hips forward, you're always gonna, you're always gonna be able to move down the track. And that's what's so important. As you can see, his elbows up, his, his you know, elbow to the sky, thumb to the eye. And that's something that's easy for you to remember, for them to remember, because it's important. And it also gives time for you to push all the way off the ground. Now, um, we talked about the car, and, and we talked about the stride weight and how you create it. Well, with, with, with Cameron, is not, he's only about 5'9". But because he runs so tall, he actually runs stride wise with a lot of guys that are about six feet. So really, the objective is it's always pushing, always pushing, always pushing. And if you continue to push, then you'll continue to go down the track. Now, um, we brought this up, which is kind of interesting. The guy on the left, I'm surprised they found a color picture of him. And yeah. so but it looks like you. <laughs> Looks like I used to. <laughs> but but it's, it's here again. It's the same thing. And if you notice, we, were, we took a picture from, and that's a 200. So that's running through. So therefore, if you're in a turn, you're in a straight, it doesn't really matter. It's still the same thing. It's basically the same thing. You're pushing off the ground. We're almost in the exact same position. So it's always standing tall, elbows to the sky, thumbs to the eye. Now, here's the thing about it. Here's the challenge. You're, you're going to, you're going to have certain cues to make things um, easier. Now, you probably have a lot of athletes that like to lean, right? That's, that's a huge problem we have because kids, they watch YouTube, they see things, and they think that your knees should go high. So what are they doing? Their, their hands stay down, or they go straight arm in the back, and they lift their knees. They lift. So whenever you have an action, you have to have a reaction. So the reaction to lifting is bending at the waist, and that's why they end up sitting. So, so what you want to do is you want to focus on that. So now, how do we get the cue? So instead of that, we have to make sure we keep those elbows and up. Now, when kids are leaning a lot of times, what I try to do is not focus on stand up, stand up, because they don't feel it. They're like, I am standing up. I'm like, no, you're not. I, mean, I am standing up. Watch their head. Because when you go forward, your chin goes back. So focus, start with focusing on getting the chin down because that brings the shoulders up and keeps the hands up. So instead of saying, you know, get your body up, work on the things that get your body up. Elbows to the sky, thumbs to the eye, chin down. Stay tall because it's going to feel uncomfortable. And then, because what we talked about earlier, it's muscle memory, they have to do it right over and over and over. So it's our job to convince the athlete that if you do it well today and then come back tomorrow and do it, terrible again, we're starting over. Because your body wants to do it the easy way. It is what it is. That's why when we do a workout with sore, we say, I don't want to do that again. You know, so we have to be vigilant and stay on them, do it correctly all the time, all the time. And sometimes you'll get 
and to a button you'll say, dude, I've told you a thousand times to keep your chin down. So either you can't do it, you don't care, or you shouldn't be here. So eventually you may have that, that moment where, dude, if you can't keep your chin down, then why are you here? So that's, so that's what I'm saying. Get the cues, the arms, the chin, and that's it. That, that'll help them get their body down. I have a freshman athlete who came in. Um, he wasn't very fast. He came in this year. And so we had to really work hard on that to get him because he was a leaner and the head was back. And finally, he looked pretty good. He ran his first week last weekend. And he was really excited. He was like, man, I feel pretty good. I said, yeah, dude, I, I knew you could do it. You're like 6'4". Of course you can run well, you know. But he's had to learn it. But it's going to take time. But now he has the confidence. He saw the results of me yelling at him all the time and um, just saying, get your chin down, get the hands up, get the belt all the time, and he saw the results, so now he's excited. He says, this works, so I can do it more. So that's the thing, you have to be vigilant and stay on them, because here again, we're working against genetics and millions of times. And you've got to do it thousands of times correct in order to do it right and continue to do it. All right, any questions there? Go ahead. Yeah. Say chin down, how far down? Basically what happens is that, oh, see, when you lean, your head goes back because of that. So when you say chin down, just, just to keep the body level. So it isn't really like the chin down, but you want to keep it level. So I say chin down because when the chin goes down, the shoulders go back. Because that's the action reaction. So, you, you know, when the chin goes down, that's it. Because a lot of times they want, the kids are thinking of reaching. And then they create something back here to reach. And it's all, it's all the arms. If you start with the arms and get the arms working, the legs will start to follow. And then you learn to push down and then you get it. I have one guy right now. It's really tough because he's so used to sitting and kicking at the end. But now he's starting to understand. So we, we gave him some drills in order to work on that and uh, to put his feet down. Because that's the thing. And guess what? He gets injured. He's, he's injured. I'm like, see, dude, I told you you're going to get injured unless you put the foot down because the leg's not designed to push, uh, not designed to pull, right? So, so really, you want your body in line, just like Cameron was, and so the chin down is down in relation to where it is on the body as opposed to being back. Because the farther you go forward, like anything, of course, because you're, you're not going to keep your head like this and run, you're going to keep your head up so you can see. So we focus on getting the chin down to get the body up. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you ever use the cue of knee lift, or is it just arms? Um, what, what, no, I don't. I don't say knee lift, I, because what happens, and, and, and it's not. I, I, I say push, because when people think knee lift, they think lifting their knees, they, they, and, and, it, and it makes sense. So, I, I, two things I don't say is phases in the race and knee lift. I, it's one continuous acceleration and push. And so, and it push, and it gets a reaction. And then I take their tennis ball. Oh, that makes sense. Because you don't want to take the ball. And it's just, just something, just, just here an example. If you t take your athletes and you just say jog in place, a lot of them, and, and you'll say, no, 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 push off the ground. And, and you can see I'm lifting. But, but you, really, you really want to push. So, so there's, there's a difference. So one of the things we do to help with putting your feet down and pushing is an extra a drill that we do that um, is that Coach Telez taught us is we take the hands, if you might have seen it before, you put your hands on your hips, you, you, you find the hip extensors, which are what are pushing when you leave the ground, and I have them run with their hands on their hips. Now, why is that? Because you know what? You can't use your arms to create the reactions. You can't, you can't reach out because you don't have your arms to, to give you a reaction. So it, it, teach, it helps the teacher to keep their hips forward and push. And, it's, it's a, and I'll have them right in place. Hold the hip extensions. You can feel those extensions. And, and that's it. So now we have to push. They don't have their arms to lift themselves. And, and that, but that's a really a challenge for people that don't feel the lifting. But you can see it. Because in reality is that when your foot hits the ground, it hits the ground with the ball, and it leaves on the big toe. But a lot of times, it leaves before it gets to the big toe. So that means you're not pushing all the way off the ground. So that's something you can see they may not feel. And that's going to be just that just a challenge. So just get them running in place with their hip extensions, landing on the ball, leading with the, leading with the big toe. All right, any questions here? No questions? All right, let's continue. Good, okay. Now, here's this action. You know you can only maintain, as you guys know, full speed about 10, 10 meters or so. 
So the interesting thing, someone asked me a question, when do you reach full speed? And I was like, I just know when I'm slowing down. <laughs> I never really thought about that. And so you really want to do the same thing at full speed that you do slowing down. And that's running fast and relaxed. And so the, the thing is, is that you, you really, really, really don't know it. You don't feel it. You just hit it and then you slow it down because you know what? It's one second, four steps, four or five steps. So the thing is that what I try to do is just tell them to, to stay tall and do the same thing all the way through the end of the race. And this is where it's really important. It's, and I say it here with emphasis, it's all about the arms. Uh, we had, I had two athletes last year, to give you an example, they ran 100 meters, ran very well. One was international and one was collegiate. And he was running the race. They were both in the lead at 80 meters and they were excited. And then all of a sudden they were running tall and looked good. I said, my goodness, they're going to have a shot at this thing. And then the arms started dropping. And then when the arms started dropping, the stride drops. And then they started leaning forward. And then neither of them won. And when the race was over, I said, my goodness, what were you thinking? And they were like, oh, I thought I had the race. And, um, but the bottom line is that you have to stay vigilant and move on. Which comes back to staying relaxed, stay tall, be patient. Now, I, I have there, it says, let the finish line come to you. What does that mean? It's, it's interesting because um, I've been in a lot of races, obviously, in my time. I've been out of races longer than I was in, which is really bizarre. But the one thing that I, I did is I created the confidence in my finish because I knew that I was running the best race I could run. So therefore, I didn't worry about what they were doing. I wasn't aware of them. And people ask me, why didn't you play football? And I said, because I had the best blockers in the world, those two white lines right there. I can still see, and I have my sense and everything else. So stay out of there. You have, of course you're going to be aware of the surroundings, but you have to be focused, and you have to think about what you're doing all the time, and staying tall, and staying relaxed. Because at the end of the race, it becomes very difficult, especially if you've run a great race and you're, you're leading. Because when I was at the 84 Olympics, and I'll tell you something, I got to 80 meters, I was in the lead, I wanted that race to be 80 meters. I was like, okay, it's over, I'm in the lead, that's it, it's, it's a wrap. But it isn't, it's 100 meters. So what, what I noticed is that you stay tall and you have to do it, you have to stay focused. Just like you were saying, um, to say push, push, whatever you do, you have to stay there. Because when my athletes crossed that line and they're both in those races, I went right up to them and um, we talked about the race because I took the same exact ritual that Coach Tillage used to do with me. When the race is over, you come to me and tell me what you thought of your race, and then we'll analyze it. Well, I went to both of them and I said, you dropped your arms. They're like, oh, no, they knew it. But they didn't know it then. And I said, you know why you dropped your arms? Because you were thinking, I won this race and the finish line was there. And they were like, how? How did you know? Well, here's the thing. I'm going to give you all a secret. All right. It doesn't matter if you won the county 100 meter dash in sixth grade. It doesn't matter if you won the Olympic Games or whatever. You know what it's like to be in a race. And so one way to get the confidence of the athletes is that if you know things that they don't know you know, act like you just figured it out. So I'll go, oh my God, I saw, you know, you dropped your arms. I know, I bet you in that race you were thinking, well, I got this thing won and everything else. You're like, oh my God, how did you know? My goodness, I'll listen to you, you're Messiah. Hell, I did it a hundred times, I know what you're thinking. But the thing is, they don't know that. Use your advantages to get the confidence in your athletes. It didn't matter how, how great you were, but use those advantages, things you've done in the past and you know it, and talk to them. They forget quick, they're on Twitter, they forget in two days. So they'll tell you a story, and it's like they forgot. You know, I, look, all you parents, you know, kids tell their stories coming the way home from school all the time. You're like, how do you know that, Dad? You told me all day. You didn't even remember. So, so the thing is, is that you, you, you have to uh, understand at the end of the race, let the finish line come to you. You have to stay tall, and you have to stay consistent. You know, it's like skipping a rock on, on, uh, on water. Now, I always tell them, why does the rock stop? You know, and, and they're like, oh, because of the water. I said, yeah, the friction of the water. Well, guess what? Guess if, if that rock could skip, get the same power every time it skipped. It would skip forever. That's what you have to do. Be patient. Let the finish line come to you. Tell them, do not think about the finish line. Just say, I'm in this race. I'm staying relaxed. My hands are tall. Whatever you're, you're thinking, stay there. It's, it's the hardest thing in the world to get. 
Because we all know everyone's slowing down at the end. It's about who's slowing down the least. And that's who generally wins the race. Who does it? it sets up the 64 and who does the end of the race. That's who wins the race. Because basically, the fastest people are not that much of a difference. It's who sets the race up and who finishes the best. And that's the thing you can actually work on. You can't, you, you, can't, you can't, once you get to someone's maximum performance, you can't make them faster other than the fact that you can have them run the most efficient. And once you get to the most efficient part of their running and their speed, you got it. But you can really, if they're consistent in the beginning and consistent at the end, they will be successful. Definitely, and we actually had a Twitter question that was based on that subject, and um, is that what you mean by running your own race? Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's one of the hardest things you can do is run your own race. And, you know, contrary to a lot of people in the old days, they said, oh man, you're just accelerating at the end, and blah, blah, blah. But no, I'll slow down like everyone else. It's just that I stay focused and stay tall and slow down the least. And also, I extended my acceleration out. Because I'll tell you something, when I came in, in, into the world, I was a long jumper, I was not a sprinter. And then I started sprinting, I was catching people at the end, and they were saying, man, we're gonna get out farther, and he'll never catch us. And, and I remember those days, and they were saying, man, I'm gonna be so far ahead, you're not catching me. Well, guess what, they were, they were like a boomerang. They went out there, and they came right on back farther. And so, I used to run those races, and I'm telling you, 20, 30 meters, I'm like, it's a wrap. They're coming back, way out there. Because you, you can only, you're burning out too far, too fast. So they've got to be patient. So if they push, 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 and let that happen, that allows to accelerate all the way to top speed and then maintain. Any questions? Yeah. You got an extraordinary amount of your, uh, out of your 4x1 relay last year. They did not look like that in 2015. Specifically, the first handoff from your first to second is as good a consistent handoff as I've ever seen in 32 years of coaching. So I want to know marks, things you're talking about to that group to clean them up, sharpen them up, and get them to, to, to run what they ran last year because it was an extraordinarily consistent, high-achieving group that was not that the year before. Could you discuss some of those dynamics, please? Well, th thanks, Vince. And, and, and I'll tell you something, Vince knows what's going on because he, when, I, when I was in Houston, he was there. I've known him for 30 years. He's a good man right there. In the relay, here, here again, we reference back. What we do is number one, we focus on the baton. The, the, so I told the people, the athletes, the baton will run a certain speed. Our, our relay team last year um, was two freshmen, a sophomore, and a senior. So we, I told them the baton. So what I did is that, of course, we use it full international. And then all about going guys, they run 10 steps. And so the, the funniest thing is that I want to make sure that the outgoing person is up fast enough where the baton does not slow down. So when you first start, it's wrestling with freshmen. The guy goes out, he runs, and of course they stop because like he's too far. So what, what I did is that I put a piece of tape um, in the zone. So I, 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 I took the outgoing guys, and I actually ran them from, his, from the international, and I ran them 10 steps, just accelerating, pushing, just like sprinting, and threw his hand back. Well, we did that two or three times. Then we put, I put a piece of tape down, make sure, I said, don't run to the man, run to the tape. So, that, so actually, there, it makes them run past the man. Now, um, since you said that, my first leg was a senior, the second leg was a freshman. Well, he gave, the, the freshman gave, he ended up running 10.26 uh, last year, but he gave the first leg, who ran 10.15, 31 steps. Um, second leg gave 30 steps. Third leg, Cameron gave 31 steps to 33. So I know it sounds like, oh my God, all those steps. So when you're coming in, you know, when that guy takes off, it's like, I'm never going to catch him. But they're not trying to catch him. They're running to that tape. And so it took time. And so what we did with our relays on Tuesdays after starts, we did relay passes. And we ran three teams most of the year last year. On Thursdays, we took it around twice. So we would we'd line up three teams, race on Thursdays. And so they get, a, they get an extra race, two races every week in practice on Thursdays, and they get the handoffs on Tuesdays. But the real key is, uh, is, is putting that tape and not being afraid to stretch those zones. Focus on the baton, not the athletes. And so we, I tried about six different combinations all year with the, uh, with the handoffs to find out who, not just who was the fastest, but who was gonna run that zone and keep the baton going and not be afraid when a guy takes off from the length of this 
uh, the length of the stage. Because that's about what 30 feet is. The length of, I, I kind of know. But, uh, <laughs> but, but it, 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 that's about it. So when someone's taken off that far away, you know, it's it. especially the freshmen, they, they freaked out. But I said, forget that. See, see, here again, we took away the variable. We made it simple. You run full speed to that tape. And then the guys got it, and they were able to really stretch it. And uh, thanks, Vince, because we were really proud of the relay team. And, and uh, we set a goal. I, our, we ran 39.5, 2015, and we set a goal of, of the school record 38.5 in 2016. And they went 38.44. So uh, that's another thing. I told them that the first day of our first meeting, the first day, I said, this is what our relay team is going to run. Who wants to run on that relay team? Everyone's hand went up, so I'll pick four of you. It's, 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 our teams are self-selected. So even now, they don't know who's going to be on it. All right, we're going to continue, and we have another Let's Talk About It section after this. Now, warm up. You know, the, 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 uh, this won't be that long, but, you know, the warming up, I think one of the things I want you to be careful about is that people uh, like to do different things. They like to do mobility and all. That's all fine. But the bottom line is we want to keep, you know, we want to keep that heart moving. So generally, when they start warming up, um, what they always do at practice, and it meets a little different, at practice, they go through their, their different exercises and stretches and different things, and then they do their strides, um, and always mimicking the running. I'm always watching their practice, make sure the mechanics are exactly the same, even in it. And, but in the meet, I do something different. Um, I always make them walk a lot. Usually in one or twos, um, I make them walk a lot. Just, just, just to get whether they, whatever they're doing. And they are not permitted to have any earphones, no telephones, nothing. It is not permitted because they need to be focused on what they're doing. If you need something to psych you up, you didn't work out Monday through Friday. So you, 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 you actually improve during the week and you show it in the meet. But if you need to be psyched up on, Friday, on Saturday, you didn't do your job Monday through Friday. That's what I tell them. So they're not allowed to do that. So they'll walk a lot. Then they'll jog. And then they do active stretches. You can see different kind of movements. But once they start warming up, they do not sit down and do any static stretching until uh, the, the very, very end. And, and they'll, they'll go through all their stretches and exercise, always moving. They'll do their strides. And then about generally about 45 minutes before the race, they'll put their spikes on. And they'll blaze. They'll go a 30 meter, 40 meter, 50 meter, 60 meter. I mean blaze, like, like Coach Tellez used to say, you, you, you get on there, you throttle. And then, now you're down to about 30 to 20 minutes because you take a little time to rest in between. That's really the only time you rest to let your body cool down a little bit for your race, just stay warm. But, but during the entire warm up, there, there's no sitting there, no static stretching or anything. Um, they like the foam roll and stuff, that's fine. After, in their warm down, but during their workout, they do not sit down. They're moving some way. They're keeping, the, they're keeping the blood flow. I want oxygenated blood in their muscles all the time. And so it's just, it's just building up. You start your stride slow, and you loosen up. You come back, you do a little stretch. You, you run another stride, you do another stretch. That's what they do. So really, meet day, from the start of the walk until the race, it's usually 90 minutes to warm up. And so there's no rush. And, I, and here again, I watch their strides to make sure the mechanics and everything are correct. So we always watch it because it's always about it because we are trying to run perfect. That's it, and that's the brain, the mindset. You will run perfect. When you run a perfect race, then you'll be able to duplicate it over and over and over. And that's, that's, that's what's so important. You got to do that. All right, now, the last thing is, I, you know, I believe, I've probably coached less at the collegiate level especially than anyone here. And I think, and one of the reasons, because I want us to have success. So my, my goal is that knowledge and information, <coughs> my mentor, excuse me, I'm sorry, my mentor and hero is Coach Teles. So he is never shy away from telling all his secrets and everything he knows. So what, what, I, what I think is that our objective, from my perspective, if we focus on the kids, then we can share everything. So if there's anyone, uh, we have ways to keep in contact. If there are any questions ever, please ask me. I, I've learned so much from all of you you have no idea because I watch and you know, all of that. I know I'm at the meets and stuff moving around, but I'm watching what's going on. I ask questions. I want us to make sure at the end of the day we are successful together. And so I, I, I want to share anything that I know because what we want is the best kids to win. And hopefully those kids go and have success in college. 
uh, do very well, become successful, be rich, give money back to your schools, win the Olympics, do all of that. That's what I want. Because I want all of us to be successful. Because you know what? We can all be successful. And so let's, let's do this together. I'm offering anything that I can and, I, and, and just hope that you uh, reciprocate so I can learn more because I've learned a lot from you. All right? So thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Great.